Hi everyone, welcome to the 31st session of the Porous Media Tea Time Talks. Um, I'm Catherine Spuren from Stanford and I'm joined here today by my uh, colleagues Kamal Singh from Harriet Watt, Frederico Lanza from University Paris Saclair, sorry for my pronunciations, and NUT, <laughs> and Sarah no Perez from uh, UPPA. Um, we have two really interesting talks today. Um, which I think will span like a good range of uh, porous media research. Um, from so our first speaker today, without hesitation, is uh, Taninen from uh, UPPA. She has an engineering degree in hydraulics and a master's degree in geomechanic structures, and she is currently a second-year PhD student studying X-ray tomography for the in situ, in situ characterization of crystallization damage in lead artworks. So I will hand the floor over to you now. Thank you for, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for giving me this uh, chance to present my work for you. Um, so uh, without hesitation, I will start with my presentation. So salt uh, crystallization damage is one of many mechanisms that threatens our cultural heritage. So most often artworks are uh, multi-layered structures, but we can find with mono-layer structures. Uh, so they have different physical properties. Uh, so uh, in the recent years, much have been done to understand the salt crystallization process in one layered materials. And um, not really much has been done on studying the layered materials. So uh, here with uh, my project, uh, we are aiming to study uh, the damage caused by crystallization uh, in layered materials. So uh, wool uh, tiles are an art mark that distinguish many European cities. So unfortunately, it is highly affected by salt crystallization damage. So for uh, our project, we have chosen to work with this uh, Dutch tiles. So uh, usually, the, these wall Dutch tiles are multi-layered uh, materials. So they are composed of uh, a clay body, which is a fired mixture of clays. We have this uh, glaze layer, which is like a glossy painting on top. And most of the times we have uh, artistic paintings as well. So the, the damage that occurs in these tiles are mostly represented by these three uh, damages. So we have shivering, which is the, the removal of the glaze layer with a part of the clay body. We have peeling, which is a clean removal of the, the glaze. So these two uh, damages are caused by salt crystallization. But sometimes we have this damage, which is crazy, which is these cracks, little cracks on top of the glaze, which is uh, caused by uh, manufacturing defects. So it was bad manufacturing, which causes this kind of damage. So in order to investigate the salt crystallization process, we have to be able to reproduce this process in the laboratory. So which means that uh, we have to put salt weathering protocol that allows us to mimic the, salt, the real salt weathering. So a uh, reliable uh, salt weathering test is described in the literature as uh, we can see in this illustration. So we have two stages. So we have an accumulation stage in which we have salt accumulating in our porous media. And then we have a propagation stage in which the damage is starting to appear in the porous media. So the most common case that we can find uh, is when um, a building that is composed of porous materials is exposed to uh, capillary rise. So the ground water, as we know, is composed of many minerals. 
and it may contain salts. So when this minerals is capillary uptaken by the porous medium and with the evaporation, we will have some salt crystals that are appearing in the pores and with the, um, the accumulation of this uh, salt we will have damage. So for my test, I, I have been uh, using these Dutch tiles that uh, actually they come from a company in uh, the Netherlands. So they are uh, real uh, tiles that were once on a building and they remove them and they sell them for reuse. So these tiles are composed of two layers. So we have uh, a glaze layer and we have the clay body. So uh, the clay body is like calcium rich clay and the glaze is composed of uh, like really heavy materials like tin and lead. So the X-ray imaging of these two layers can give these two images. So as we can see that the glaze is, uh, have these big pores that are disconnected, but actually they are caused by the manufacturing process. It's just air that was trapped in the glaze. And we have the clay body that is appearing very uh, heterogeneous. So uh, in order to investigate if whether or not there is already existing salt in the structure of these tiles before doing any tests with them, so we have conducted an X-ray diffraction analysis uh, uh, in which we have uh, concluded that indeed there was no uh, presence of salt crystals. And then a uh, porosity inv investigation was conducted on the clay body of the intact samples, as well as uh, on the clay body of crazed samples. So the results showed that the clay body of the intact samples showed more porosity than the clay body of the crazed samples. So the when we have higher porosity, we will have higher chance to have more salt accumulating in our structure. So we have conducted the preliminary uh, weathering test. So as an accumulation stage, so we took a core in our tiles and we have uh, contaminated it with uh, 1.26 mole uh, of sodium sulfate. And then after the contamination, we have dried it in a climatic chamber in this 25% relative humidity and 21 uh, degrees Celsius. So we have done this for three cycles, contamination, then drying. And in each before each cycle, we, uh, we conduct a scan in, in order to, um, to compare the state of the sample before each cycle. Also, we, we weighted the sample so we could, um, we could uh, easily see that there, are, there is salt accumulating inside, in which we have a bit more for the crazed samples. So this is an example of the scans that we have conducted. So here we have a scan for the initial state of the sample. So before the, the contamination with the salt. And so this picture represents this region which is in the interface between the glaze and the clay body. And this one uh, here represents the clay body. And this second picture is representing the same region after three cycles of contamination and drying. Uh, and this one as well is the same with uh, after three cycles. So uh, when we look at these two images, we cannot see any changes really. 
but when we do image treatment, we can do like a subtraction. And the, the, the subtract in the subtracted uh, image, we can see that there is actually salt accumulating inside of the structure. And this is represented as like a block, as clusters of salt. And this is only observed in this upper region, in the interface between the glaze and the clear body. So using also the image treatment, we can look at the evolution of the porosity. So here in blue, we have the porosity of the initial structure before the contamination. And then in red, we have the porosity after the three cycles. So we can see that clearly that in the upper region, we have, we have that decreasing in porosity, which means that there is indeed salt accumulating inside of the structure. So after this accumulation stage, we'll have the propagation stage where we will have the damage. So in this one, we have conducted one uh, cycle, but this time we dried it for uh, 24 hours in ambient conditions with 42% or less humidity and 21 degrees Celsius, and then transferred to the climatic chambers the, the climatic chamber and dried it in the previous conditions. So here again, we have monitored the, the accumulation of salt by weight in which we see that there is accumulation. And also we have conducted another scan. So uh, at first glance, visually, we saw that the sample was cracked. So in the X-ray, we can see that the, the, the interesting thing is that the crack is really following the pattern of the, of the salt cl cluster. So the damage only happened where in the interface between the salt cluster and the other part of the clay body. And also with the monitoring the evolution of porosity, we can see that there is, this time there is salt clusters everywhere. And here we have an increase in porosity, which, which is uh, translating to the crack, the big crack that we have. So to conclude is that this salt weathering that we have conducted actually mimics realistic scenarios of salt weathering that really happened. So, for example, here in the literature, we have these um, damaged tiles, which are real damaged. And with comparing it to our uh, images of, of, our, of the damage that we got from the weathering protocol, we can see that it is like in a similar pattern. So, thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for your questions. Okay, thank you, Tinnan. Uh, I don't know if uh, there are questions from the chat. I would start uh, uh, if there are other questions or good questions. I would uh, like to ask you if you have um, analyzed or you are considering analyzing actually how the salt, uh, uh, in this case, the sodium sulfate uh, aggregates uh, and crystallizes because you're, you're talking about crystallization. So I'm expecting uh, some sort of uh, some sort of regular bonds, at least uh, some sort of lattice, uh, like a proper crystal. So what does it mean exactly crystallization or is uh, in general an, an amorphous solid that, uh, that uh, solidifies with the uh, Randomic bonds. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, in this study, we are more interested in the damage that is caused by the the crystallization of of the sodium sulfate, 
And um, with the technique that I'm using, which is X-ray tomography, we cannot really see the crystal because you, you should have really high resolution to, to be able to see the crystal. So we are, we are in a, just like interested in how this um, damage, but in the, the meso scale, like in the, in the. Um, okay. Yeah. No, sure, sure, sure. Because uh, I just expected that, uh, uh, for example, if uh, the sodium sulfate crystallize with a regular lattice with a proper crystal, maybe the properties of this damage can be different because uh, the crystal uh, is uh, is uh, harder to be removed, for example. The bonds are uh, stronger in general rather than an amorphous solid, so maybe uh, putting the attention on that can be useful. I don't know, I'm, I'm just uh, guessing. Uh, yeah, I, I usually here, like the crystals that are damaging is uh, mirabilite and tannerdite, like the, the, the transmission from tannerdite to mirabilite. Mm -hmm. This is what causes the damage. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. And uh, have you considered other kind, or are you going to consider other kind of salt rather than a sodium sulfate? I, yes. I suppose that it is common, of course, yeah. in uh, yeah. cultural heritage, but I don't know if you have considered other kind of uh, salts. Yes, uh, actually, we are working also with sodium chloride, but mm -hmm. for now, we didn't get any damage with this, with the use of this salt. So okay. we are considering okay. other protocols maybe to, to get damage with this salt. Okay, okay. Really interesting. Okay. Thank you. I have a, I have a quick question. Uh, this is just a curiosity or general question. So in, in your experiments, you, you did four cycles and then you stop when you see the crack. Uh, yes. Do you have any plans to go further? Like if you do further cycles, even if they, it cracks or you think it doesn't matter then afterwards? Uh, actually, we, we didn't think of doing more cycles after the, after the cracking. And, and again, this is still like a, like a first weathering protocol. And yeah, okay. mm -hmm. development. yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming, let's say, yeah, let's say if, if we got stones, building stones, and some of, some of them under some load, so you mm -hmm. have some compression already on that, that would affect because you, in your experiments you don't have any any load on these ones right yes would, would, would it, but i think you show that the, the the laboratory ones which you see is they very comparable to the field scale but you see right already there yeah yeah um, mm -hmm. actually yeah it should it should it should affect it because the the, the tensile strength will be changed so yeah, with some load, maybe it will be easier to damage the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then if uh, there are no other questions. And there's one in the it's comments. One. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, how can I see? Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to read it. Hi there. I noticed that you reduced the relative humidity for inducing crystallization rather than increasing temperature. What's the motivation for this choice? And how do you control the airflow rate? So, um, actually, uh, like the, the damaging process with sodium sulfate is when you go from this phase from thanodite to mirabilite or from mirabilite to thanodite. So mirabilite in the in the climatic conditions that I have used before in the accumulation stage, I only will have thanodite. So the use of this uh, in the fourth cycle in this conditions, ambient conditions is to create this mirabilite phase. And for the airflow, actually, I'm using a climatic chamber, so it's uh, there is no airflow. So 
it's standard. You can like you can specify the climatic conditions that you want, and you will have these conditions inside. Okay. Are there any other questions? I have like just a quick question, if that's okay. Um, uh, I think it was maybe slide 16 or 17. I'm not sure if it's easy for you to go back. Um, maybe 17, I think. Yeah, this yeah. one. So, I mean, this looks really interesting, but it seems like the areas that are like with the higher porosity look like the most affected. I'm not sure if I'm looking at this right, but like, is there a way that you're going to like change how like these tiles are made so that you can kind of minimize the amount of salt weathering, like dependent on like the pore size of the like within the tile? Yeah, I mean, if, if you, the, if you control the manufacturing process, you will have like uh, nicer tiles that were not affected by this uh, salt weathering. But the problem is that when the tile is aging, mm -hmm. there are some defects that are created inside. So even if you minimize the porosity at first, but with the aging, the, the tile will be vulnerable. So it will become prone to the salt damage. Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to thank you again, Tininan, for your you. uh, really interesting presentation. And uh, I would like to present our uh, uh, next uh, guest, uh, which is uh, Wei Yuli. Uh, so welcome, Wei Yuli. Uh, Wayuli is a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University. Her research focuses on the modeling of uh, lithium ion on, or lithium metal batteries, for example, effective model of uh, ionic transport, simulation of dendrite growth, and other uh, relative features. So, Wayuli, it's your turn. Thank you, Federico, for the introduction. Uh, today, I would like to uh, present my work on the modeling of lithium dendrite growth in lithium metal batteries. Uh, each battery cell consists of uh, two electrodes, the cathode and the anode, uh, and they are separated by a separator and the electrolyte that would enable the movement of ions inside the electrolyte. And in the lithium ion batteries, people use graphite as the anode material, while in the lithium metal battery, people would use lithium metal as the anode material. Because lithium is the lightest uh, metal with the lowest uh, electrochemical reduction potential, and it has a much higher specific capacity, uh, like 10 times greater than that of the graphite-based anode. Um, so we to interrupt, but could you go onto the full screen for your slides? Oh, yes. Um, okay, sorry, I share a wrong screen. Oh, no worries. Okay, I will restart. I think now is the right one. Is it coming up? Um, it just has a loading symbol at the moment. Yeah. Maybe try connecting and disconnecting the yes. uh, screen share. No, I think I got it. Uh, try this. 
Yeah, that looks fantastic. Great. Okay, now it's full screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I would uh, continue on uh, where I stopped. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, this yes, is this. Yes, yes, okay. So um, I just talk about why we use lithium metal uh, as the anode material because it has a higher specific capacity than the graphite based anode material. And so uh, using the rechargeable lithium metal battery is uh, the most promising, one of the most promising uh, electrochemical uh, energy conversion and storage system uh, to meet the power and energy demand for electric vehicles. However, there is a severe issue related to lithium metal battery. That is during the charging process, the lithium metal would deposit on the anode and form the lithium dendrite, which would cause a rapid capacity degradation. And uh, when the lithium ions concentrate around the dendrite tip and would form the spiky structure to cause the short circuit. And the formation of the lithium dendrite is one of the major issues that impede the commercialization of rechargeable lithium uh, metal batteries. How, uh, how do people uh, control the lithium dendrite formation? Like they would use uh, like concentrated electrolyte, a uh, pulse plating of flowing cell and mitigating uh, side reactions and enhancing the solid electrolyte interface or applying uh, external pressure. However, the underlying uh, mechanism of dendrite formation and uh, a continued propagation is not uh, fully understood. So here uh, we uh, conduct a linear stability analysis of electrode deposition on the lithium anode in lithium metal batteries. And we would uh, investigate the balance between the stabilizing effect and the destabilizing effect. And we would uh, solve for the dispersion relation and look at the system parameters. And we also uh, focus on the effects of preferential diffusion with electric field dependent uh, transport coefficients. And next, I would give a short overview uh, of the literature in the literature. And they are like uh, several recent advances in morphological stability analysis of electrode deposition. And the people study the linear stability of transient electrode deposition and the steady electrode deposition while assuming a microscopic electron neutrality or accounting for the extended space charge density. So the problems uh, I'm solving here is uh, first to relax the assumption of uh, electron neutrality. And also we would apply uh, electric field altered electrolyte diffusivity, and we will consider the anisotropic diffusivity. And next, we, uh, I would discuss uh, the methods and the problem formulation. And here we consider a two-dimensional half-cell domain to study the electrode deposition on the lithium anode. The lithium metal electrode surface uh, initially locates at, at x equal to zero and is in contact with the uh, electrolyte. And the lithium ions in the electrolyte uh, would uh, transport from the electrolyte to the lithium metal surface and undergo uh, Faradic reactions and the electrons and the, uh, with the electrons at the electrode surface. And then the lithium ions would reduce to the lithium items and then deposit on the uh, lithium metal surface. And for uh, to describe the um, the transport phenomena, and we use the nurse planck equation and the Poisson equation for the electric uh, potential. And for the boundary condition, uh, first, the uh, anion is, in, uh, is inert and does not uh, react with the, uh, with the electrons at the lithium metal surface. So the flux is zero at the surface for uh, the anion. And the, for the cut ion, there is a reaction rate, which uh, would be uh, given by the butler bomer equation that I, I'm going to show later. And at the boundary, the right boundary is the electrolyte. And we apply uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition with uh, zero electric potential and fixing the concentration of cut ions and uh, anions. And uh, 
we also apply a minimum uh, uh, cut-ion concentration at the lithium metal surface. And also uh, along the Y dimension, we apply a non-flux boundary condition. And here uh, R is the production rate of lithium metal I just mentioned and given by the Butler bomer equation. And uh, eta is the activation over potential like by taking the difference between the uh, applied electric potential and the, uh, the electric potential in the electrolyte and the standard electric potential. And the time evolution of the uh, H is the surface height of the electrode is given by uh, the current into the anode. And also here, we consider the effect of electric field altered diffusion uh, coefficients in the electrolyte and here we introduce the uh, electric field dependent diffusion coefficients. And here we could see with the presence of uh, uh, electric field, uh, the diffusion coefficients of uh, cut ion and anion would be altered and they would be uh, direction dependent. And then uh, we study the stability of electro deposition on the anode along the X direction by applying a sinusoidal perturbation in the Y direction. Uh, by applying perturbation at the surface height, we can also get perturbation uh, in the electrical potential and the concentration. And then we would do the Taylor expansion around the base state interface X equal to zero. And we can also evaluate the reaction rate and expand into first order. And then we can do the same thing, like expanding the diffusion coefficient like to first order. And then after substituting these equations and the expression for the diffusion coefficients into those uh, governing equations, and then we can collect the order one and the order epsilon term, and we can obtain the equations for the base state. And here are the equation for the base state and the boundary condition for the base states. They are just the steady state equations for the uh, PMP equations. And they, uh, here are the equations for, for perturbed states and the boundary conditions for uh, the perturbed states. And the perturb, uh, to solve this uh, system of equations numerically, uh, we use uh, for the, to solve the base state equations, we use the metalite boundary uh, value solver function. And then, uh, for, and then we solve for the perturbed state equations. And we uh, like follow this uh, numerical method using a, a 1D second order accurate finite difference approximation for uniform grid uh, with n points. And then we can read uh, the resulting, then we solve the resulting generalized eigenvalue problem with a uh, uh, MetaLife's eigenvalue uh, function solver. And then we can see some uh, results. And the first of uh, this figure uh, shows the uh, base state uh, cut ion concentration uh, and anion concentration and the electric potential and the charge. Uh, density by using uh, the constant uh, diffusion coefficient. And we could see that under a small applied electric potential that the uh, cut ions are not uh, depleted at the electrode surface. And from the charge density plot, we could see that a local neutral electron neutrality holds uh, even uh, close to the electrode surface. However, under a large applied potential, that the like the base state uh, current density would uh, uh, exceed the limiting current density, the cut ion uh, concentration is close to zero near the electrode surface. And we can see from uh, the last plot that there is a extended space charge region like extends to uh, point uh, 0.02 L. It's, uh, it's a large space charge region. And we can also observe a very high uh, electric potential gradient near the electrode surface uh, when applying a, a high electric potential. And next, uh, we would uh, investigate the effect of electric field on the ion diffusion and the electro deposition. And first, we compare the uh, charge density distribution uh, at the, the, uh, the growth uh, uh, at the base states 
using constant diffusion coefficients and uh, electric field dependent diffusion coefficients. And here we could see under a small applied uh, potential that electron neutrality holds for constant D and electric field alter D, and their results agree. However, under a, a much higher applied electric potential, we can see that a local electro uh, neutrality is violated and there is a difference. We can see from the zooming figure that the, there is a higher uh, charge density for the electric field altered uh, diffusion coefficient than using the constant diffusion coefficient. And finally, uh, here uh, I show the numerically a uh, computed growth rate uh, that is plotted against the wave number using a uh, constant diffusion coefficient and the electric field dependent diffusion coefficient. And therefore, uh, several uh, applied electric potential. And here we can see uh, using a low electric potential that the growth rate is zero uh, for range of wave number, which means the electrode surface is unconditionally stable. However, with increasing the applied electric potential, we could see within a range of a wave number that the growth rate becomes positive and reaches a, a maximum growth rate at a maximum wave number. And then um, further increment of the wave number uh, would decrease the growth rate, and the, finally the growth rate would go down to zero, and which is the uh, at a critical wave number, and it becomes uh, negative uh, with increasing uh, wave number, which means the electrode surface is uh, stabilized. And also, uh, we can see that by using the electric field altered diffusion coefficient would give us a higher prediction of the growth rate, like by uh, 20% in this case compared to the using the constant diffusion coefficient. So uh, in summary, um, there, are, uh, there are several bullet points. And the first, the electrode surface is unconditionally uh, stable under small applied potential and the local electron neutrality holds under small applied potential where there is a extended space charge region and a high applied potential. And we also conclude that under high applied potential using electric field dependent diffusion coefficient, the maximum growth rate is higher than the maximum growth rate by using the constant diffusion coefficient. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you uh, for, for this great presentation. It was uh, quite a new field for me. I learned quite a lot of things. Uh, thank you once again uh, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, if uh, from the studio, if anybody has questions, uh, please you can ask and up to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type into the chat window. Uh, I, I have one, one bit curiosity driven question, maybe just very naive. Uh, this this is actually nice. I think the last last slide summed it up uh, using the diff constant diffusion coefficient or not. I was I was curious, although maybe it's not practical. If you change the temperature conditions and stuff like this, how would that impact the dendritic oh. growth? Oh yeah, thank you for the question. Like uh, the temperature is a very important factor in modeling dendritic growth too. Uh, but here we use a constant temperature. Like for yeah. example, using uh, changing the temperature and the diffusion coefficient would be dependent on temperature too. And one another interesting thing is like in the follow-up work, we would also include uh, like a uh, energy uh, equation and to include the uh, impact of temperature. That would be interesting. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think it would be very nice to see where we do see the optimum solution so that we can control this dendritic growth, right? So that you don't have short, short circuits here. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, anybody else has questions? Um, I had a question as well, that's okay. Yeah, sure, absolutely, please go for it. Um, you were saying like the different diffusion rates had like a really large impact on like uh, the amount of growth. I think that was on your final slide. Um, but I was just wondering um, uh, like what the impact that would have like in, in the batteries, sorry, I'm a bit new to the research, but uh, like, is this like a good thing? 
or like a bad thing? Uh, you mean like a, uh, changing the diffusion coefficient in the electrolyte? Yeah. Oh yeah, so for the battery design, it's a very important factor to consider, uh, like what kind of electrolyte we want to consider and what are the, uh, like the behavior of the ions in the electrolyte, right? Like when the ions uh, transport to the uh, elect electrode. And we want to find uh, like electrolyte that would uh, give us like would uh, surprise the dendrite growth, like we do something about the electrolyte whether altering the uh, diffusion coefficient, for example, or by applying an electric field uh, externally, and that would uh, uh, optimize our battery performance, like by uh, mitigating those dendrite formation. Thank you. Uh Another one uh, short question is that so you you're doing this uh, simulated work so you have any experimental data stuff on on to on to compare against the results? Oh yeah, this uh, is another um, follow up work. We mm -hmm. want to uh, we want to also like collaborate with people who do the experiments, but I don't know about experiments. Um, no, no, so no. we want to also like to. Uh, uh, to 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 see if our uh, results using like uh, like for example the electric field dependent diffusion coefficient and would agree like better than the the, the previous one than using the constant diffusion coefficient yeah. and also we are uh, we also want to explore like the state of the art like solid state battery using the solid electrolyte and uh, like by applying our analysis and then uh, compare to uh, the experimental results. Fantastic, cool. And uh, okay, I don't have a question from the audience, but uh, there's a comment from Wow Wong, uh, Yao Wong, uh, for he thanking for the nice, impressive talk, which I totally agree to. And if there's no uh, further questions, I'd like to thank you uh, for this this fantastic presentation once again. And I would like to thank both of our speakers. For today's presentation, there was a nice discussion, and Sarah is back with us, and it's time to wrap up the session. So, uh, so I would like to announce our next speakers. Uh, we got two fantastic talks coming up uh, in two weeks. Uh, the first one is from Kundani Bha Mitra, who's going to talk about hysteresis and dynamics uh, of flow in porous media, and the second one is from Stefan uh, Lunova who's going to look into contact angle dynamics during miscible fluid flow at the pore scale. So uh, please join us for the next session and uh, we can discuss. And uh, for now, thank you for uh, watching our studio. And if you have any questions and you can contact us on porousmediattt at gmail.com. Not only questions, if you have comments. And this is our beautiful team growing and uh, with this, I'd like to close the session and see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.